Um, so, if you're wondering what's behind me, I can see that it's partially covered. Um, but um, of course, I have Brianna Taylor's name um, after that outrageous news of today. And I also have a poster that's from Revcom.us of the heroes who have actually um, stood up and lost their lives in the struggle against the Trump-Pence regime. Um, so the whole situation of immigrants is part of this. Again, our event tonight is called Crossing Borders in an Age of Anti-Immigrant Fascism. Um, for women tell their stories. And again, this is part of Revolution Books 60 Defiant Days. Um, so share, share, share this event. Um, get your friends to get on the uh, Facebook and the YouTube, um, announce their presence. And, um, and I guess we just started actually sharing this. So I'm gonna announce it again. Welcome everyone to our event tonight, Crossing Borders in an Age of Anti-Immigrant Fascism. Four women tell their stories. This is an important event. Please share, take the opportunity to share with your friends right now. We'll be starting in a couple minutes. Um, this and all the programming that we're doing both in Harlem, Revolution Books in New York City, and, and Revolution Books in Berkeley is part of our series, 60 Defiant Days. In the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. The Trump-Pence regime must go. So, um, so welcome. Um, we'll be inviting you all to put your comments in the chat so that we can read them to the participants. Um, there, Raymond is going to describe the flow of this event and what will happen. Um, and um, we're going to start probably in about two minutes, I think. Um, so sit tight and um, get ready for a, a very special evening. And um, so glad that all of you could come. Reiko and Ray, I'm still disabled. Okay, um, welcome everyone. Um, I am now going to turn the evening over to Raymond Lada um, from Revolution Books in New York City. Um, Raymond, would you like to present um, the speakers and introduce what we are doing here tonight? All right, thank you, Reiko. And uh, my name is Raymond Lada. I'm a spokesperson for Revolution Books. I write for revolution, revcom .us, .us. And um, again, I wanna welcome everyone to tonight's program, uh, Border Crossings in a Time of Anti-Immigrant Fascism, Four Women Tell Their Stories. And those four women are Rosa Pablo Cruz, Julie Schweitzert Colazzo, Pam Laskin, and Pamela Kirpius. And I will tell you more about them and their work uh, in a moment. But I wanna let you know that this program, this panel tonight is part of our ongoing series of programming uh, that Rico was telling you about, 60 Defiant Days from Revolution Books talks, dialogue, performance. 
in the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. The Trump-Pence regime must go now. And this series of events is an emergency response to one of the most dangerous situations in modern history. Fascist regimes are threatening to turn, to tear the world apart, to tear it to pieces. And the most monstrous of these regimes, the Trump-Pence regime, is setting out to marshal forces to hold on to power and to impose full out fascism in America, full out fascist rule. And uh, just today, this afternoon, people may have heard that in Louisville, the cops that murdered Breonna Taylor were slapped on the wrist. Basically, they got away with murder. And this is in an atmosphere where people are in the streets, protesting, fighting against this vicious police terror and institutionalized racism. And Trump is glorifying these cops, unleashing white supremacist vigilantes. This is what's going on. Just in the past few days after Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, without stopping for a second, Trump has gone forward with his plan to stack the Supreme Court with anti-women, anti-immigrant, white supremacist judges, uh, justices. This is the direction he's trying to take things in and they are moving quickly and they are determined to actually predetermine the outcome of this coming election. If that means suppressing the vote, if it means not holding the election, this is where they're going. And this is the backdrop for the 60 defiant days of programming that we're doing here at Revolution Books. And at Revolution Books, we get into why this is happening, what it is about the whole history and functioning of this system that we live under, capitalism, imperialism, that's produced this genocidal, racist, Trump, Pence regime. And here you also find the way out of the madness, the solution, which is the revolution to change everything. And here you discover the works of the leader of that revolution, Bob Avakian. So 60 Defiant Days is actually inspired by an historic statement that Bob Avakian wrote. I'm gonna hold it up and you can get it at revcom.us, go online, revcom.us. And this is entitled On the Immediate Critical Situation, the urgent need to drive out the fascist Trump-Pence regime, voting in this election, and the fundamental need for revolution. And the aims of this special programming, these 60 defiant days, are basically to deepen people's understanding of what we're confronting and to learn from history and from the experiences of people throughout the world to heighten people's determination to take on and stop this fascism before it's too late through mass sustained nonviolent struggle that the call from, from refusefascism.org is putting before people and acting on uh, beginning on September 5th and October being a critical month for people to go into the streets to create a political situation, a crisis, so that we can actually drive this regime from power. And we are also through this programming, raising people's sights to the revolution that humanity leads, needs to put an end to all this suffering and exploitation in today's world to emancipate humanity. So we're very excited about tonight's program, uh, the special panel that we're holding. And uh, now I wanna formally introduce uh, who's gonna be speaking tonight and let you know about the format. We have Julie Schweitert Colasso, who's a bilingual writer, founder of Immigrant Families Together, which is an organization dedicated to reuniting and supporting immigrant families separated at the US-Mexico border. We have with her 
both um, uh, Rosa Pablo Cruz, who's the author of The Book of Rosie, A Mother's Separation at the Border. And this book, by the way, was shortlisted by Time Magazine as one of the best books of the summer of 2020. Then we have Pamela Kirpius, who's the founder of Migrants of the Mediterranean, a, human, a humanitarian storytelling organization that documents the journey, the journey stories of the people who've crossed continents, countries, desert and sea to reach Europe. And then we have Pamela Laskin, a professor at CCNY, City College of New York, who's the author of Why No Goodbye, which is a young adult novel in verse, which tells the story of a young boy fleeing from Myanmar, a Rohingya uh, national minority. And this is a story that exposes the painful wake of the world's newest genocide. So these are gonna be our four speakers and the format for tonight is we're gonna start with uh, Julie and Rosa. Um, and then we're gonna hear from Pamela Kirpius. And then we'll close out with Pam Laskin from CCNY. They'll give 10, 15 minute, 15 minute presentations would be great. And um, they can tell us about their work, both literary, literary and advocacy work that any uh, of, the, of, the, of them are doing. We'll have some conversation. We'll bring the audience in with their questions. And then I'm gonna be saying some more about Revolution Books and our $15,000 fund drive uh, to keep this bookstore vital and viable and more impactful. So let's get going with um, Rosa Pablo Cruz and Julie Schweitzer to Colasso. And it's all yours, the stage and the platform. And we're really excited uh, to have this program, to have this kind of panel with this kind of experience. So Julie, I hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Raymond. And thank you, Reiko, and everybody at Revolution Books, um, not just for the invitation to Rosie and myself to speak tonight, but for um, organizing the 60 Days of Defiance. I think. Um, I hope it will be both education and inspiration for folks who are tuning in to remember um, if they've lost sight, which it has been easy to do during this administration, of their own power and ability to act. As Raymond said, my name is Julie Schweder Coyazo, along with my husband, Francisco Coyazo. I am the co-founder of Immigrant Families Together. Um, we are a nonprofit focused on immigrant advocacy. And in just a few minutes, um, I will read an excerpt to you from the Book of Rosie about how we got started and how Rosie and I met. Um, although the memoir, which is available in English and Spanish, in Spanish it's available as El Libro de Rosie, published by Harper One in English and Harper Collins Espanol in Spanish. Um, the, the, the story is called The Book of Rosie and it is mostly a memoir of her experiences in Guatemala, the reasons that she came to the United States with her two sons, that journey, and then the experience of being separated from her sons at the border for 81 days before they were reunited. Um, it's also a book about um, the organization and our relationship as it has developed um, over the course of the past two years. Um, the format is because Rosie is primarily Spanish speaking, I will um, read an excerpt in English and then she and I will have a brief conversation which will be carried out in English and in Spanish. And of course, we'll be happy to take your questions. I would like to take a minute though to um, just hold a moment of silence for Brianna Taylor. Um, I really appreciate Rick and Raymond um, bringing Brianna to the fore tonight. Um, at Immigrant Families Together, we absolutely believe that our work in immigrant advocacy and in abolition is absolutely inextricably, intimately tied to eradicating the police surveillance and prison industrial complex systems in this country, the fight for justice um, and safety for black Americans is no different um, in many respects than the fight for um, black and brown immigrants coming to the United States. So if we could just take a few moments um, to hold 
um, Brianna and other victims of violence in our thoughts. Thank you for that. So typically, Rosie and I have done a number of um, Zoom meetings and book clubs. Um, her book came out on June 2nd. Typically, we share an excerpt from her section of the book, but I thought that it might be helpful tonight to actually read an excerpt from a chapter about how we began as an organization, both so you can understand a little bit about our work. I think in the context of this panel, that's important but also um, so that, again, you can really tap back into that idea of individual personal power, um, particularly as we really immerse ourselves into this election season and focus on the arduous work of unseating Trump and Pence. So this excerpt is from uh, chapter 12, which is called A Wild Idea. Rosaira Pablo Cruz. Such a beautiful name, I think to myself though I barely have time to think at all these days. Since June 25th, 2018, my life has changed completely. My phone rings with calls and buzzes with text and WhatsApp messages 24 hours a day. As soon as I empty my voicemail, it fills up again. Before June 25th, I was a writer, editor, and translator, kept busy by my work and my three children, ages eight, four, and three. But now I found myself on the other side of the news cycle, not as a journalist, but as a subject of reporting. Outraged by the family separation policy at the US-Mexico border, I have suddenly become a successful fundraiser and activist who is leading a grassroots group that is quickly coalesced into an organization which we call Immigrant Families Together and a movement one that is confronting me with tough questions about what I want to be doing with my own life. My most frequent caller is Jose Orochena. I first heard his name a few days before June 25th in an interview with a reporter on New York's public radio station, WNYC. I had dropped my husband off at the hospital for an appointment and planned to head back home with our youngest daughter. My phone lit up with a Twitter notification, a group of mothers, many of them with babies strapped to their chests or backs, was occupying the immigration office downtown, a protest intended to express their outrage about the zero tolerance policy that was separating parents from their children at the Mexico-US border. Let's go, I said to our three-year-old. By the time we got to the immigration office, however, the protest had disbanded, so we got back into the car to go home. I was tempted to change the station and listen to some music, Lately, the news had become increasingly heavy, almost unbearable. As a mom, as someone who had spent long stretches of time living and traveling in Latin America, and as the wife of a refugee, the images and stories of family separation being filed by journalists in the borderlands carried a particular weight I couldn't shake. But I was hoping we might hear something about the protest on the midday news, so I left the station on. Reporter Beth Burdick was speaking with Jose Orochena, a New York City attorney, who was talking about his client, Jenny, a mother who was in detention in Arizona and whose three children were in New York City's Cayuga centers. I think that the only possibility of reuniting Jenny Gonzalez Garcia with her three children is she gets bonded out, comes to New York, and picks up her children and fights her asylum case, he explained. As soon as he said this, I knew, finally, how to answer the unanswered question that had been plaguing me for days. What can I do? The same question so many Americans have been asking themselves and each other since we'd learned of the forcible separations that were occurring at the border. So after um, calling Jose Orochena directly and asking him if it would be okay to start a crowdfunding campaign to raise the bond for his client, Jenny, um, it uh, quickly escalated. We raised the money for her very quickly and money just kept coming in as did offers to volunteer to provide support. Um, and we have since that time posted bond for 119 adults um, reuniting them with their children and their families. Um, Rosie is the sixth mother 
for whom uh, we posted bond. And after being released from the same detention facility in Eloy, Arizona, um, she flew to New York to be reunited with her two sons, Jordi and Fernando, who were in the same foster care center as Jenny's sons, Cayuga centers. And so I thought we would take a few minutes um, to talk to her, not so much about that experience, but about the experience of uh, her life after having received asylum earlier this year. Um, in February of this year, she was granted asylum. And also particularly how she's reading this moment of such extreme instability, um, anxiety and fear, particularly in immigrant communities and particularly coming after the news that broke last week um, about the hysterectomies that are being conducted against women's will and without their informed consent, not just in the detention center in Irwin, Georgia, um, but also in other detention facilities, which is um, a case that we are actively working on right now. So, Rosy, me gustaría presentarla al, a la comunidad de participantes hoy. Le expliqué que después de haber leído eh, este eh, parte del libro, que vamos a platicar un poquito eh, dentro del contexto de este panel que tiene que ver con el tema de eh, Des, eh, eh, de sacar el presidente Trump y su política anti-inmigrante. A mí me gustaría empezar, en vez de lo, lo usual que discutimos en, en los foros de Zoom, um, me gustaría empezar preguntándola cómo está leyendo usted este momento de ansiedad, de miedo, eh, de temor, Dentro del contexto de las, elección, de las elecciones aquí en los Estados Unidos, eh, ¿cómo está viviendo este momento usted y su familia? Aunque ya tienen el asilo, debe de ser un momento también eh, muy cargado para ustedes. Sí, primero que nada, gracias este, por invitarnos para compartir con nosotros también lo que es este, esta historia de vida que ha sido un poco, este, bueno, creo que ha sido el enfoque de todos en este momento porque estamos viviendo momentos muy difíciles. Creo que, este, más que nada, eh, ha sido muy, muy estresante porque a pesar de que, de que sí, a Dios gracias, yo tengo el asilo, mis hijos aún están en un proceso. Entonces, este, pensando en, en, en lo que es mi caso, este, sí me siento estresada. Sin embargo, me pongo a pensar en los casos que todavía están, que, que incluso muchas personas que no han sido escuchadas. Yo creo que son momentos de mucha tensión, eh, más que todo de un llamado de conciencia a todas aquellas personas que tienen el poder de, con el voto, hacer el cambio. Este, siento que es una responsabilidad muy grande y deberían de hacerlo. Um, pongo, me pongo a pensar también en, en, he visto en las noticias de que han sido muchas personas deportadas y, y a veces me pongo en esos zapatos, pensando en el temor que se siente en, en todo. No solo es un, un sueño truncado para muchos, también es, este, para muchos es el temor de perder la vida, como ha pasado en muchos casos. Entonces, creo que este tiempo es de mucha reflexión, un tiempo muy importante de que si quieres hacer el cambio y, y puedes hacer la diferencia hoy, deberías de hacerlo. Para toda la comunidad que vivimos este, en este hilo, es muy importante, muy importante el apoyo de todos los que pueden hacer este cambio. So, Rosie says, um, first of all, she'd like to thank everyone for being here tonight. Um, and for being concerned about this issue and says, yes, we are absolutely living in a very difficult moment. And that although she herself has asylum, it is a terrifying moment because her children are still in the process of seeking asylum. Um, but beyond thinking of her own personal case and their situation, 
thinking of all of the people who are still detained, all of the people whose cases are still in process, who possibly have not yet had a chance to be heard, have not had their day in court, quite literally, um, and says that she believes that there are so many fears that are tied up in the anti-immigrant policy of this particular moment. There's the fear of deportation because of the number of deportations that have occurred, the fear of not having justice. Um, and, and she believes that all of this is really for those of us who are able to vote, that for us, this is a call to conscience, um, that we have a responsibility to vote and to participate in the electoral process. Eh, Rosy, ¿qué cree que, eh, que necesitamos hacer como un país o, o como una sociedad en términos abstractos, pero también en términos concretos para poder visibilizar eh, aún más los inmigrantes, tantos los que ya tienen asilo, eh, pero quizá no pueden votar todavía? tanto como los que siguen detenidos. ¿Cómo podemos traer sus historias y sus necesidades eh, a la luz y centrarlos en el diálogo eh, electoral? Déjame decirlo en, en inglés. Um, I'm asking her, how can, what, what kinds of changes, both abstract and concrete, need to be made, in her opinion, in our electoral process in order to make visible um, asylum seekers, refugees, immigrants, both those who have already been granted asylum and those who may still be in the process, as well as, very importantly, people who are still in detention and who are the least visible of all. Es una pregunta muy interesante. Este, creo que también yo me la he hecho muchas veces. Pero siento que la forma eh, para para que las personas este, se sientan más seguras, más que todo la, la, la comunidad migrante como nosotros. Este, para nosotros es muy importante sentirnos eh, respaldados, respaldados por, por personas que tienen la, la capacidad o la posibilidad de hablar. Entonces, brindar esa seguridad nos hace este, a nosotras, la comunidad migrante, eh, nos da esa fuerza de hablar. Entonces, siento que si nosotros hablamos, eh, nos van a escuchar, pero para hablar necesitamos tener, um, perder ese miedo, ese miedo que todos tenemos y que lo hemos cargado por años. Siento que la única forma sería este, um, que nos den esa oportunidad, ese derecho a hacer valer nuestros derechos más que como migrantes, como seres humanos. Porque si, si te dan la opción de hablar como ser humano, te escuchan y eso es lo, lo básicamente importante. En las detenciones, lo que hacen es apagar nuestra voz con intimidaciones y eso, eso es lo que hace al migrante mucho más vulnerable y, y tiene miedo de hablar por las consecuencias que puede traer esto debido a nuestra situación legal. Um, she says that that's an interesting question and one that she's asked herself many times. Um, and above all, she feels that the answer is um, that it's important for immigrant communities um, to be supported. And I would add, it's important to also understand that any term immigrant community, just like we speak about, the Hispanic community, the Latinx community, the black community um, is not a monolith by any means. But she says that your vote is their voice. It confers upon immigrant communities the ability to be heard, to have their needs and their experiences centered in a way that they themselves may not be able to bring to the forefront and reassures asylum seekers and immigrants that it is. Um, Perhaps not that it is free of danger to speak, but it helps begin to chip away at the layers of fear, which are instilled very early on in encounters uh, with the law in the United States. She specifically says detention silences immigrants and asylum seekers through fear of reprisals, through fear that um, whatever they say or if they speak out 
will um, impact their uh, case ultimately. So again, really understanding that um, for folks who may be marginalized and whose voices may not be centered historically um, in the electoral process, that our vote and the responsibility of voting helps to bring those communities' concerns back to center. Um, Rosy, ¿cómo, ¿cómo vea el proceso electoral? Um, y ya tenemos casi dos meses antes de la elección. Eh, ¿Cuáles son sus preocupaciones en este momento y cuáles son sus esperanzas? And I just asked, uh, with two months less to go now, um, before the election, what are her uh, greatest anxieties and fears and also her greatest hopes? Bueno, mi preocupación en sí es, mm, es que, que nuestra comunidad latina es, se, se sienta este, o pueda ser manipulada. Regularmente este, nuestra comunidad, este, pienso que en, todo, en todos lados, pero específicamente la comunidad latina a veces suele ser como más flexible a ser manipulada por ciertas regalías, cosas pequeñas este, que, que creen que podemos lograr y habiendo cosas mucho más grandes que quizá cuesta más, pero, pero vale más la pena. Entonces, ese es el, el temor de que, de que muchos, este, uh, por pequeñas cosas, eh, se puedan dejar manipular y dar ese voto de una manera equivocada. Eso creo que es, es, lo, es el, el temor que, que uno siente este, de no poder hacer el cambio cuando, cuando no se analiza bien un, un voto, que es en este caso el, el que podría hacer ese cambio, para, no solo para la comunidad latina, porque, porque reconozco que hay muchos, este, muchas personas como ustedes que nos han dado ese apoyo y que se han esforzado. Entonces, eh, creo que sería muy importante eh, analizar ese voto. Sería un llamado a la comunidad latina que no, no nos conformemos con cosas que, que, ten, que son nuestros derechos, sino vayamos más allá más allá para hacer ese cambio, para cambiar ya de una vez con este racismo, con, con esta humillación, con este sometimiento que, al que hemos venido siendo desde muchos años atrás. Um, she says her greatest worry is that the Latino community can be easily manipulated for people, for Latinos who can vote, to really consider carefully who you're voting for, why and what the impact will be, not just in the short term and not just for you um, individually, but over the long term and for the larger community. Um, that the expediency of what you may be voting for in the moment, um, in the long run, may exert a far greater toll. Um, y por el momento yo creo que vamos a dejarlo ahí porque yo sé que la audiencia va a tener preguntas también. So I think that we will um, hold for now so that we can um, uh, hear from the other panelists and then also invite um, listeners into the conversation. So again, thank you for having us and we are looking forward to the continued conversation. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So uh, I want to thank you for that uh, for that talk, for that presentation, and the back and forth between you, uh, Julie, and Rosa. And what I'm thinking is that maybe we should hear from all of the speakers, and then we can have a conversation afterward, including the speakers themselves responding, you know, to the talks. So I was hoping that we could go that way, and then also it would give the, the, the viewing and listening audience more of an opportunity to kind of 
take in, you know, these different experiences and also the different ways in which this is being given expression, you know, through uh, the work of, 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 of your organization, Julie, and the work of Rosa, and then um, the, the liter as I said, the literary manifestations of this, what, you know, what, what, um, what, what Rosa has done in her book and, uh, and Julie's, um, you know, young adult novel. So what I'd like to do then is uh, bring the next speaker into the, into the, uh, uh, the program, the panel tonight. And let me just introduce her. And um, this is um, Paula Kirpius. And uh, Paula, excuse me, Pamela. Pamela. Uh, Pamela is the founder of Migrants of the Mediterranean, which is a humanitarian storytelling organization that documents the journey stories of the people who've crossed continents, countries, desert, uh, and sea to reach Europe. So that's uh, coming right now. Uh, Pamela, are you there? I'm here. All right, there you are, great. Hi. So um, tell us about the work of migrants of the Mediterranean and um, what you wanna bring to the table, the metaphorical table tonight, um, in terms of the life experiences of uh, migrants and asylum seekers in Europe and the commonality of what um, oppressed humanity is facing in a world in which people are being uprooted from, from you know, their native countries, uh, from their livelihoods. What are the factors involved? What is driving people you know, to Europe and what is the harrowing journey that they have gone through and what are they facing? So it's all yours, uh, Pamela. Sure, thank you Damon, for having me and thank you uh, Revolution Books for hosting this. Um, and I should say right away that um, actually what's really different about the storytelling we do at Migrants of the Mediterranean is that we don't speak about those push factors, what drives people to leave because it's humanitarian in nature our purpose is to merely give face and a voice to the people who haven't got one. You know, the imagery we know about the migration crisis, as it's known, more of a humanitarian crisis really in the Mediterranean, uh, is an, a picture of an overpacked boat. We see these images coming in off the sea, but we don't actually know who the people are. And the truth is all of those people have suffered extreme human rights abuses. And so for me, it's, um, it, when this work began, it wasn't about uh, decoding why, why are you here? Um, especially after they had suffered as they have. Um, the, the purpose was really to, again, give them a voice so they could have a moment of dignity after having um, suffered so much. Um, it is my responsibility as, um, as, as the lead of the organization and the people who greets those people um, to, to be there and, and greet them as an equal and to give them a chance to release um, some of the pain uh, in, in the moment they have with me when we're actually speaking and, and meeting one another. So that's, uh, that's one of the biggest things that's different about the work, but humanitarian storytelling um, at Migrants of the Mediterranean is really about um, a hybrid of journalism, humanitarianism and contemporary history, because uh, the first step of course is actually greeting those people. So actually it was almost exactly four years ago that I was on Lampedusa, which is a very small island in Sicily it's closer to Libya than it is to Italy itself, which is why it's so important as this island of reception. People can actually reach that island first before anywhere else. So Italy ends up being um, uh, the main reception point. It's the southernmost land point um, of Europe. So uh, when people are escaping Libya, crossing the sea, Italy will usually be the first country to pick them up. Many will go to Lampedusa. That's where I was actually one day after the election in 2016. And I remember thinking when I was out on this, in this very desolate place, it's literally a rock in the middle of the sea, 360 degree view of the sea. And uh, looking out and thinking um, that this actually was the best uh, response that I could have to what was happening um, after um, Trump was elected in 2016. 
there was so much uh, collective sorrow and outrage um, in, in those days that followed the election. And, um, and it felt good to actually be out and doing something productive on behalf of a cause that mattered to me that does, it's not represented by this um, administration. So, um, so that's kind of how it began. Um, and, and even before that, I had traveled to the island to understand, first of all, what was just going on here? Uh, I'm American, I'm from New York City. Um, it is odd for Lampedusans to find uh, a New Yorker on their island. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty small town, <laughs> um, I think around 6,000 uh, in the low season. So, um, so it's a bit of a change of scenery for a New Yorker. Um, in any case, uh, one of the things that was missing from the research up until that point in November when I returned after the election in 2016 um, was actually speaking to the migrants themselves. I had done field work around the island, spoken to uh, people in the military to understand the border control perspective. So, uh, I spoke to locals to understand just how did they perceive what was going on? What did they think? Um, but this time I started speaking to the people and, um, and that changed everything. Um, immediately the work became about them and um, I was personally curious about them and I also felt uh, accountable. Um, being there as an observer, I knew that I had a power to actually share their stories and I wanted to connect with them. You know, I think actually, that's the personal side of this work is that at that point, there was nothing for me to like really sink my teeth into. Um, and, um, and so in doing this, I could, I could act. So that's how Migrants of the Mediterranean began. I started recording their stories. Where are you from? How long did it take you to travel? What, where did you travel through? By what means? What happened along the way? And when did you arrive? And so it's a journey story in that way. And we don't talk about the why because, uh, and this is something I learned much later as, um, as we would um, document their stories is that, uh, is that there's an asylum process for them to follow in those subsequent months and years. And so if they're talking to me about the whys that can actually affect their asylum outcome one way or the other. Um, so by intuition, we really, we really just followed the how did you get here angle and what happened more than anything what happened because uh, again it also being aside from humanitarian it's also uh, historical we want to put down for the historical record what actually happened because there's still a lot of skepticism about what did happen to these people and there's a lot of people who don't want to believe it's true so in creating a, a document of that we have a more complete historical record that we can go back to um, and then what is uh, the, the next step of humanitarian storytelling is that we stay in touch with the people we meet. So when I interview people for those first journey stories, it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's very personal, and I'll give them my contact information. And as they move off of the island or from elsewhere in Italy um, to their housing camps, when they begin the asylum process, um, they'll keep in touch with me. So I'm in touch with, you know, many of the people, let's say many of the people that I follow um, who I met on the island and, and elsewhere, and they keep me posted where they're at, how it's going. Are you learning the language? Um, how's your housing situation? Are you going to school? Are you working? Do you have documents? How's the asylum pro, you know, all of the, all of those things. And so then I follow up with them and I will actually go to their housing camps um, and, and wherever else life, brings them. Uh, this is, ha, has been across Italy, but now it's expanding into Germany. Um, there are people I know who are also uh, in Belgium, France, the Netherlands, and so the reach is really growing. Um, so this is the scope of humanitarian storytelling, and what we hope with those, with those last um, uh, stories, those follow-up stories that we have of people on the ground, is that these are case studies that people can actually use, people in public policy can actually use to inform the, uh, the laws and the, the programs they're instituting. So now we have like a real, maybe we have a more realistic reflection of what we need because we have a document also of how people are living on the ground right now with us. I'm actually going to leave it there because that's kind of like, uh, you know, the, a pretty broad stroke of, of the work. 
but um, I think in questions, we can open it up a lot more, um, except to say one last thing after uh, hearing you, Julie and Rosa, is that um, something else I've come to learn um, in the course of this field work too is uh, the parallel with US-Mexico. And I actually greet you right now from Arizona. I'm here for a short trip before I return to New York and then onward. Um, but right here, people are crossing the desert. In, in North Africa, into Europe, they're crossing a sea. Here, it's a desert. So we're talking about the same, it's the same thing, a different landscape. Uh, in, in Libya, you have traffickers. In uh, US, at US, Mexico, you have the cartels. So we're looking at really the, the same issue. We just talk about it differently, different set of language and um, different geography. So again, Raymond, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call on you now because I, I, I wanna leave it there but, uh, and, and wait for questions for more. All right, thank you, uh, Pamela. And uh, we're gonna go to our next uh, panelist. And uh, that is uh, Pamela Laskin, Pam Laskin, who is a professor at City College of New York. Uh, she teaches the writing of children's and young people's literature and is herself an author of young people's literature. And um, she is going to read, I believe, right, from Why No Goodbye, am I correct? Uh, I am. Great. That was that was the understanding and the <laughs> and um, um, so I think it would be great if you could set this up and um, read a portion uh, of this um, of this novel. So I hand it to you. Thank you, Raymond, and thank you, Julie and Rosa and Pamela. I love sharing this Zoom stage with all of you. And thank you, Revolutionary Books, whose mission I greatly believe in. Ray knows that I've been a supporter of the bookstore for the last year. I've encouraged my students to get involved because it's one of the few, um, the only bookstore in Harlem of its type and also their political mission in particular, ending the Trump and Pence regime and really taking to the streets, being up in arms about all the politics that are currently going on. And certainly Pamela and Julie and Rosa all pointed that out, the idea of how scary it is to be an asylum seeker. And I love Julie that you gave Brianna that moment of silence. It really moved me. And it, I feel that that as a country, we all have to be up in arms about what's going on. And that's what I try to do in my book. So I'm really going to focus on why no goodbye, but because I'm making a pitch for immigrant families together, I've been working a little bit with Julie and Rosa. I'm just, um, this is a children's picture book, My Secret Wish. And I wrote this to raise money for immigrant families together. It's a picture book about a young boy and his family seeking asylum. And I think there's lots of ways of doing fundraisers and I hope we will all feel it incumbent upon ourselves to engage with different important causes. And there's, this is one among many now. And that's, really been my mission as a writer in recent years is cause-related writing. Uh, what I try to do is focus on an issue that is important to me, write a book about it the way I did my secret wish for immigrant families together, and then donate the proceeds of the book to an organization. So um, why no goodbye? I worked with Fortify Rights with um, whose focus is immigrant families in Myanmar and that regional area and families, um, many of whom are Rohingya Muslims who are in the camps now. We have had a lot of discussion about 
people living in the camps, people living in jails, people living in the most adverse of circumstances. And how do you get out of that? So my goal to help these families and to help this organization was to write this book and use it as a fundraiser. And it's been fairly successful. I feel really good about all the money I've given to Fortify Rights. And what it does is, I'll just read you the back blurb before I just give you a short reading and then we can open up the whole panel to questions. What happens to a Rohingya boy left behind? A mother escapes Myanmar with three of her four children. On the cusp of adolescence, the young boy left to fend for himself is filled with rage. He does not know how to read. So why does his mother bother smuggling in these letters? Joubert begins to express this anger in his own letters as he develops a level of literacy, eventually becoming a reader and writer. Written in letters, why no goodbye or why no mining in Burmese explores loss, grief and transcendence. Why no goodbye? Here's the first letter and uh, it started out the book started out as um, a series of found poems, found poems as in I found them in articles in newspapers and magazines. So this was an article, this was, the book is, not was, loosely based on this news event from the New York Times. Escape to Malaysia, New York Times, June 6, 2015. How could you leave your firstborn? How could you tell him his father is dead when you are crossing the sea to Malaysia with the babies where he might be? True, it was full fair to pay the smugglers to take Joubert too, but you never even told him or even said goodbye. Letters to Maymay, and Maymay means mother. Why did you leave Maymay? You know I cannot write, so why are you writing me? I gaze at the long dirt road which leads to more dirt. Keba, which means help. Something terrible happened. I can still hear your screams and men with mean smiles on their faces, guns that were arms, arms that were guns thought nothing of firing their rage wildly in our village, and Maymay, children were never spared. You never taught me to read or write. Haji is teaching me. Haji is the farmer he's being interned to. And some of the incidents in the, this book are based on facts and others are fictionalized. He wants me to read your letters. You can keep your letters. Same way you keep my two brothers and sister with you. Why didn't you say, Viney, goodbye? I may learn how to read and write, but I still sleep on the soil. Last night was a monsoon. Haji let me sleep inside. But just one time, he told me, everyone in Thayat Oak knows me. So sometimes there are bamboo houses where I can sleep for the night. Yak, your letters should stop. And here's the history. One night, they barged into the hut, military men, and you told us to pretend to sleep. But I heard the shrieking, the crying, saw the pools of red bleeding on the floor. Please stop, yak, stop. And the men, they left. And when my sister, just a baby, cried, they left even harder. Haji says, seven is the magical number. There are five children in his hut. Haji and Lenwen make it seven, and I am the eighth. I am the other child. What is magic, Mama? I do not think I have some. Did you not have enough money to take me? I never cursed you before. I never thought I would. I would never do this to your face like street kids do, but now I am one of them. Wait, hoot, 
to you, which is a Burmese profanity. I want to stamp you in the soil and stamp my feet till you are crushed like the snake I step on. You will drown in the rain. You will cough when the soil is dry and my ears will not moisten you. Bayat oak means mango orchid in our language. Where are they? Pima, another profanity. How did you get these letters to me? Obviously that's fictionalized because she couldn't do that. Why do you write them? They are like garbage. Why did you take my brother and leave me tired and hungry? How did my father die at night when it is raining? I cry for my brother, especially my younger one. I cry for my sister. I cry while the sky cries with me. Your screams, yeah. Yeah, yeah, your pleas, my baby. Please protect my babies. And their laughter rings in my ears like a nightmare typhoon that gets bigger and uglier with each monster laugh. I learned this today. I can write it too. I am a hard worker. I am an ox. I am a whale. This is what Haji says. I am dependable. I like the sound of it, dependable. It sounds like I am someone important. Why do other Muslims hate us so? We are Rohingyas, we are Muslims too. Even the monkeys who roam freely laugh at me. They laugh like the monsters who hurt you and drank blood for fun. Now I know more words so I can tell you. My back is broken from the water pails I must carry every day. And from the little sleep I get with a blanket of angry stars above me, there are dead dogs in the water. But Haji says he boils the water so I will not get sick. The air smells of rot. I am 13 soon, I think. I do not remember my birthday. Do you? Do my brothers and sister remember me? Why did you take my other brother? Here is my day. I wake up tired. I wake up hungry. I want to cry. There is no time for this. I eat some rice. I drink some water. Then I go fetch water and fetch and fetch and fetch till my arms collapse at my sides like two dead trunks of broken wood. We had a hut, it was bamboo, and sometimes it felt moist since the river was inside, but it was our hut. We had a hut with four children. Sometimes there was laughter. Sometimes there was mohinga for dinner, but always there was a warm body to feel next to you and someone to share stories with. We had a hut, a mat to sleep on, we never walked under the clothesline. We had a hut and I had a hug, even though I had to share it with someone. This is what I think. One day I had a father, he farmed, he made some money. Sometimes we ate lefet, sometimes we could not, but we were a family. He left for safety for the family, but he didn't take us. This is what I know, that it is some cruel joke, since now you are gone too. And I'll just read one or two more. This is what I know. I do a lot of this is what I think and this is what I know as a construct. This is what I know. The sky at night is filled with monstrous sounds, hissing, screeching. Sometimes girls plead, no, no, no. And there are guns going off, cries, no, no, no. The monkeys wail for their mamas. Yes, I want to get out of here, but how? And here's, I'm going to conclude with the last letter when he's starting to read a letter from his um, mother. I never taught you to write since I never wanted you to dream. 
My dreams were once the sun, the moon, the seas. I forgot I was a girl. I forgot I was a Rohingya. I never taught you to read since I did not want you to discover there was more than the little I could give to you, a world beyond our small place where people went to work and their words mattered. I never taught you to read or write since I was afraid for you to try to fly. I knew there was no fuel in our world and your wings, which were enormous, would only come crashing down. Don't worry, I would not dare to dream. Where could it possibly take me? That's Joubert speaking. This is what I know. Dreams are stupid. Thank you so much, um, audience, everyone who's sharing and listening to us tonight. And um, I guess we're all on now and open for questions. Ray and Rosie and Pam and Julie. Yeah, okay. Uh Pam, thank you for that reading and the commentary that went with it. Um, so uh, I was gonna open it up to the people on the panel and I wanna encourage people in the audience to post any questions or comments they have uh, in the chat room. And then we can, uh, we have people that are monitoring that and then we can you know, share those questions and comments with people. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, kick off, we'll bring everyone back in, the speakers here. I wanted to kick off, you know, some, some, some conversation among ourselves. And, um, you know, uh, uh, Pamela had said, uh, Pamela had said that because of the constraints of the work that they're doing in Europe, uh, it's not uh, possible for them in their official capacity of, you know, of, of, of facilitating, you know, asylum requests by, um, uh, the refugees coming into Europe to ask why, why are they fleeing these countries and why are they coming to Europe? But here at Revolution Books, we do ask why. And, uh, and um, I think it's important for us to, you know, to explore and probe this some. Um, I mean, especially, you know, here in the belly of the beast, the United States, the US, you know, empire writ large. And, you know, I think it's really, uh, you know, necessary to come to terms with why do people come to, you know, to the U.S. And, and uh, Rosa and, you know, Rosie's story is, you know, documenting, you know, the flight and, you know, the struggle to come into the U.S. And, and the very fact that, you know, there are these borders, you know, that, you know, the borders that keep people out, that, that lock people in, you know, these borders are not a fact of nature. They've been created you know, historically, and the U.S., I just want, you know, the U.S.'s borders were established through, you know, conquest and war, and, um, um, you know, one half of Mexico was ripped away, so it's the height of hypocrisy, you know, for, you know, the rulers of the U.S. and Trump to be talking about the right to secure borders, when those borders have been, you know, the product of, you know, this kind of conquest and annexation, um, and, um, why do people come here? I mean, we're talking about intense acute poverty in these countries. Why is there such poverty? This has everything to do with the domination, the economic domination of these countries by the US. Um, in Central America, the twisting of these economies to serve you know, the needs of export agriculture to serve the US market, the US propping up regimes in Central America and fueling and uh, civil wars, you know, to advance, you know, its interest and all of the horror and the devastation that's resulted from, um, you know, from this, you know, the, the, the ways in which the U.S. Has, has backed, you know, the terror against the people, death squads. And as I said, the investments and the trade agreements have ravaged, uh, you know, uh, local agriculture and, you know, created a situation where people can't survive in these economies. And, you know, this is all part of the reasons that people come to the United States. You know, they're coming here because they are driven by these conditions, but these conditions are principally created by the system that we live under in the world, which is capitalism, imperialism in the U.S. and the capitalist imperialist countries of Europe are the ones who benefit, you know, from, 
you know, all of the tribulations that people live through and suffer as a result of the economic, political, and military domination. And then in Europe, we're talking about countries like Syria, where there's, um, you know, civil wars, and you have the U.S. backing some side and the Russians and the French backing other sides. You know, you have this kind of, you know, conflict that's going on, and the people, you know, suffer enormously for this. And even the climate crisis now in Central America and large parts of the world is driving people, you know, out of their homelands. And, um, you know, it's ruining, you know, uh, in terms of desertification, you know, the arid lands, ruining agriculture and rising sea levels and just the destruction of economies. But what is the principal cause of this climate crisis? It's human made, but not just human. It's a, the, the, the Western imperialist powers of, overwhelmingly responsible for this global warming. So these are all the reasons that tens of millions of people come to the United States and then they're pilloried and vilified, you know, because they're coming to, 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 to save lives and to, to, to save children and families. And, you know, I just wanted to sort of give that backdrop in terms of the why. And I wanted to ask Rosa, uh, Rosie, if she could Tell us a little more about the conditions in Guatemala that, um, you know, resulted in her, you know, coming, you know, to the United States. If she can talk about that and Julie, maybe you could, you know, bring, you know, bring some, uh, some experience and insight to bear, you know, from the standpoint of your work. What are these conditions? And for instance, I do know that in Guatemala and Honduras, you know, these are countries that have among the highest rates of femicide, the murder killing of women in the world, you know, and what does that say about the whole state of, you know, of society? So I just wanted to have, um, um, you know, start with, you know, coming back to our first two speakers and maybe give us a little more of a picture of what were the conditions that are driving people, you know, from Guatemala, Honduras, Central America to the US and how is that bound up with, you know, the very unequal relations that exist in the world today? So. Um, I just wanted to hear a little more about, you know, those conditions. Sure. Um, oh, I have an echo. Um, Raymond, I wanted to thank you for raising that point because I was also really struck um, by Pamela's emphasis on that. And I wanted to say thank you to Pamela um, for really de-emphasizing the why. And I'm going to get back because I also do think it is important to look at the why, but I think it's really the context and the framing that are so critical. Um, one of the experiences that Rosie and I have had um, in the, the book tour and talks about the book are so many people do focus on why did you leave, right? What is that story? What was the precipitating factor? What were the precipitating factors that provoked uh, your departure? And I think after a while, um, we both got really fatigued by that question, right? Because it was this request that she put her trauma on display over and over and over again, right? Rather than nobody ever asked her, for example, almost never, um, with the exception of the BBC, um, rarely do people say, how are you doing now? What are your plans for the future? Nobody was looking at like, what did you, what do you have to contribute? What are your goals and plans here? What, what is it like to build a life here? So I think there are sort of two, two ways at which I'm coming at this. And one is very much, I think, the lens through which Pamela is looking at this, which is, um, I think we have to be really cautious about asking people to put their individual stories of pain on display for our consumption in order for us to be able to understand. And on the other hand, I think, Raymond, you're absolutely right. And I think this is largely the function of books and bookstores and media and storytelling is to really deeply contextualize um, why people come. And obviously the individual story does have a profound impact. One of the challenges we have um, grappled with throughout the life of immigrant families together is really um, understanding that from a storytelling and fundraising perspective, it would be extremely powerful to tell these stories of people's flights, right? And the, the trauma that they've experienced um, but also respecting their privacy and their safety and sort of their dignity and autonomy. And so I think often when people ask me, um, 
how can I get involved? How can I, what should I do? Uh, you know, how do I volunteer? I will often say to them, I don't even, you know, yes, come support immigrant families together, whether it's through a donation or whether it's through your, your volunteering or whether it's through, as Pam Laskin has done, using your talent and your skill and your knowledge in the service of the organization through fundraising or what have you. But I really want to see more people getting involved at the really hyper local level in their communities. What you're talking about, Raymond, is really educating. I have my kids are now uh, 11 as of today, um, seven and six. I, we, they are students in the New York City public school system, and we're still learning about Columbus and Pilgrims, right? And not the Columbus and Pilgrim story that we, who are supporters of revolution books, want you know know is the the right version of the story. So I think you know what's what are we teaching our children about U.S. imperialism? What are we teaching our children about all of the many many um, uh, horrors that we've perpetrated in other parts of the world? And what is our culpability and our responsibility historically and currently? Um, so that's what I would sort of uh, respond to that. But um, Rosy, eh, Raymond, me gustaría preguntarla, eh, no en, en su caso particular, pero ¿cuáles son los factores que usted ha visto en, en, entre las personas que se han ido de sus países de Centroamérica, um, e, e, entre las mujeres con quienes eh, estuvo detenida? ¿Cuáles son las condiciones que provocan la huida de un país para el otro. Bueno, creo que este, las decisiones son totalmente diferentes. Sin embargo, este, hay algo en lo que eh, se centra todo esto. Y es, um, bueno, son dos cosas muy importantes que me di cuenta en, en este tiempo que estuve en la detención y que, he venido conociendo aún después de salir de la detención. Este, en los casos son por eh, violencia, la mucha violencia y la falta de oportunidades en el país de, poderse, este, de poder tener una vida digna. Eso es lo que empuja a la mayoría a salir de su país. Creo que estas dos cosas vienen de la mano porque... Si no tienes dinero, no tienes cómo defenderte de quienes te quieren hacer daño. Entonces, este, son, son dos cosas que aparentemente muy separadas, pero tienen una conexión muy fuerte. Si nos damos cuenta y vemos a profundidad el tema. Y, y Raymond dijo que le gustaría destacar también, y yo creo que usted ha tenido esta experiencia propia, el hecho de que lo del eh, cambio climático ha tenido un impacto también en cuanto a la posibilidad de tener una vida digna, no solamente si puede seguir viviendo en su tierra, eh, si, puede hacer, eh, si, puede hacer un, si puede trabajar la tierra, si la tierra se produce, ¿no? Eh, hemos visto en Centroamérica y sobre todo en Guatemala el, el impacto del cambio climático y falta de cuidar la, la madre tierra Um, y, y todo eso que se ha provocado. Sí, eh, el cambio climático es algo demasiado importante que a veces no, no, no nos damos cuenta, pero puedo decir por experiencia propia de que en nuestro, en nuestro país, yo que trabajaba en mi país, de, uh, tenía un negocio eh, lo del cambio climático vino a afectar lo que es la cosecha del café, que es el sustento de, de los guatemaltecos, más que todo es lo que este, exporta. Eh, la baja de este, de, este, de este producto, el precio, porque no se dio una buena cosecha por todos estos cambios, viene a empobrecer más al campesino y por ende también, nosotros los que trabajamos en un comercio también, o sea, nos afecta. Esto es una, es como um, una, una, una ruleta, ¿no? Que va dando vuelta. Entonces, sí, es muy, muy lamentable, pero en todos los aspectos nos viene afectando, yo creo. Um, so Raymond, she says that while people's individual decisions are very personal, um, she's certainly seen in detention and among other folks that she knows 
that um, two primary factors are what cause people to flee their countries of origin, um, one of which is violence, and the other being the lack of opportunity to build and lead a dignified life. And she says these absolutely go hand in hand. Lack of opportunity feeds delinquency, which feeds violence, which feeds the um, migration cycle. And that she can certainly say from firsthand experience that um, the environment and climate change are very important. They absolutely have an impact on migration, though we don't always talk about it frequently in the context of reasons why people are leaving. Um, she said in the case of Guatemala, for example, climate change and the impact of the coffee blight, which we do talk about in the book, um, have certainly impacted um, migration flows, which is a fairly well-documented fact. Um, and in the book, we do talk about a lot of other factors that not just prompted her own um, flight from Guatemala, but also are impacting migration overall out of Guatemala and Central America. Um, we talk, we have a chapter called the migrant highway talking about, um, the drug trade and, um, human trafficking and sort of, um, how these are also prompting northward migration. And she just wanted to point out that, um, the interlocking nature of these variables really produces this domino effect where, again, when you don't have the lack, uh, when you do have lacks of opportunity, um, and then they're sort of compounded by all of these other variables that there's no choice left but to flee. Yeah, um, I wanted to thank uh, thank uh, Rosie and um, Julie for you know engaging this question. I want to make it very clear, and I think this is the stand you know that 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 we all you know embrace. I'm sure that no human being is illegal. No human being on this planet is illegal. And um, the, the humiliation and the intimidation and the uh, fear of answering questions the wrong way, why are you coming here? Um, you know, this is all part of the, the systems of control, you know, that bring such misery to people throughout the world. And, you know, here people are forced by the kind of economic and social circumstances that we've talked about, you know, to come to the very country that is responsible, primarily responsible, you know, for the conditions of poverty, the climate right crisis there. and the effects on agriculture, the economic deprivation and the, 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 the continuing, uh, you know, wars that are backed by imperialism to serve their geoeconomic interest, you know, whether we're in Libya or in Syria, um, or the, you know, the situation that existed in Central America in the 1970s. A lot of that, you know, the, the, what we're, the gang violence, you know, this is the fallout of the whole destruction of society uh, in, the, in these countries. So I'm, I just wanted to make very clear that when I pose and when we pose and we're talking among us, ourselves, the question of why, it's the larger why. You know, what is it about the... <laughs> The larger why, and I think that's really critical for people to understand because on the, you know, and I think this is where, I'm, you know, I find this very uh, important, the discussion that we're having, and we can bring in uh, Pam and Pamela, you know, to this, that there's the individual stories that are told, whether they're the actual chronicles of real people or the fictionalized, you know, recreation of the conditions that have given rise to this. But there's a relationship between the individual stories that are told and the larger, you know, pulling the lens back, the larger forces, you know, that are at work, you know, and that is first and foremost, you know, the, the weight of imperialism, the way this whole world system operates and it is benefiting the, you know, the rich capitalist countries and it is creating these horrible conditions in these societies. And then people come and have to, again, justify themselves and this is what you uh julie were responding to and i think it's 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 a really important point and we have to respect the privacy and the uh you know the integrity of of, of people as individuals on the other hand their life stories are themselves a microcosm of these larger forces that we're talking about so i just wanted to make this point and at revolution books the revolution that we're talking about to overthrow this capitalist imperialist system and the new communism that's been brought forth by Baba Vigian is, 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 is proceeding from the, 
the whole world comes first. We're talking about putting an end to exploitation and oppression throughout the world through revolution and not just in one country, but to, but to, to advance the world revolution so that we can create a world community of humanity without borders. Because these borders and boundaries serve imperialism, but they separate sections of humanity from each other. And we don't have to live that way. We can use the resources of this planet for the betterment of humanity and create a diversity of humanity in which people are cooperatively and consciously changing themselves in the world. That's this vision that's actually put forward. I just want people to know about the constitution for the new socialist republic in North America. This is a vision and blueprint for the society that can be built to free humanity from all this suffering on the basis of overthrowing this system. And I would encourage people to go to um, you know, revcom.us, they can read this uh, online, they can come to Revolution Books. Uh, this is a critical document in terms of what we can actually do through making a revolution in which a society can go to work and uprooting all of this. And a world <laughs> without borders is, you know, essential towards the goal and as a reflection of the goal of, 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 um, of um, a world community of humanity. So I just wanted to sort of make this point about the relationship between the individual stories and the larger social and economic political forces at work. So I just wanted to end with just that particular point. And then let's hear. You are me, Ray. Yeah. Pam and Pamela. Yes. Sure. Well, I mean, that's actually the mission uh, with Migrants of the Mediterranean is we use the stories, we use the individual stories to connect people because there's a big problem with how we see and how we see each other right now. And so our way into it, you know, the way that we move into that issue is to actually introduce the individual people. So it's not about seeing this big crowd of people. It's not about seeing an overcrowded boat and not understanding anything else other than the color of their skin from the looks of that picture. Uh, or if you're on the ground in Italy and you go to Termini station in Rome, well, there's a lot of migrants that are congregating around there. These are the images that people have and this isn't really fair. You know, they're people, they're individuals, they're not scary. And so the work that we do is there to actually introduce the person, show their face. If you can look into the eyes of the other human being, you actually see yourself. So uh, it's, it, this is a, a slower way, a slower approach to actually break that down. But it's just the same as you're walking down the street. Raymond, I have never seen you before until tonight. Um, I've, you know, if, I, if I saw you on the street, what, what would I think of you if I saw you? I don't know. But you know, I wouldn't have any sense of you really. There's a there's a tall white guy with glasses. Okay, cool. But if I stop and I introduce myself and say hi, now everything changes. Now you smile. Now there's a little softness that sort of comes into your demeanor. Um, and this is how we break down borders. This is the migrants to the Mediterranean approach, and that's why. Uh, yeah, I mean it. You, I found it so valuable that you know when you actually have that connection you can't go back, you know, when you actually know who the person is, you can't unsee that. So it makes it harder to actually uh, defend policies and, um, you know, other things that don't, that don't serve them and, and ultimately us. Pamela, you just said something really interesting that I thought about in relationship to my first book, which was Ronit and Jamil YA book a Palestinian, Israeli, Romeo and Juliet for teens. Um, and the idea that there, um, the hashtag that I used was we build bridges, we dismantle walls. But as you were speaking, I was thinking about the bridges that I would love to be created in the world and how um, this administration has built up so many walls that I'm not sure how to step over that world. You said, if you see a person, they're more than just that stereotype. I'm not sure how to get into that the world now, cross that bridge now, 
with the level of divisiveness we have between um, two very polarized sides because there are people who understand um, intrinsically how horrible this administration is for our lives in every which way. And then there are um, the Trump supporters and Pence supporters who I'm not so sure how I can engage in a conversation with them. I, I feel awful saying that because that's, if we're talking about, I can have a conversation with practically everyone else, but I can't with, with us, this political, in this politically polarized state of affairs, then there is no bridge that well, I want to I think you just, I think you just nailed the thing is that you have to confront that. You mean like, I think that's where it starts is really on this individual level where you have to figure out a way, you know, cause Trump supporters aren't going to go away. And in fact, I can tell you where I'm at right now. It's a kind of bizarre experience for me right across the street. There's somebody who has a Trump Pence flag outside of their house, but also I know those people they're my parents' neighbors and they're nice people, you know? So it has to start there, you know, as long as we are demonizing people, then it makes it really hard to connect. So we have to do it. We have to start within ourselves, you know, to make those changes. Uh, I'm sure actually there are even people who are watching this who might be conservative or Trump supporters. And you know what, they're not, automatically bad people. We don't agree with the politics maybe, but that doesn't mean that we can't find something to connect us. And I think when you get there, then then that's where the progress is made, but it starts with ourselves, you know? And I think that's a good challenge for you. I don't know how to talk to a Trump supporter. I mean, surprise yourself, see what happens if you meet one. That's what I would say. That's I an have, opportunity. In fact, I I'm That's just, an opportunity for you, Pam, actually, you know, like for them to hear you too and what you're thinking and why it's so important to you. You know, I would make that, I would put that at stake. You know, Who's I want to, uh, uh, hi, I want to enter into this. Um, you know, we are, as I said at the beginning, we are, you know, in, in one of the most catastrophic uh, situations in modern world history. We have the spread of these fascist regimes, you know, in Europe, you know, we see these right wing movements here in the United States, the Trump regime. And this is a powerful, powerful phenomenon right now. It has Trump and company, you know, are themselves, you know, the rallying point and the spear point, you know, of this fascist, you know, juggernaut, you know, which is racist to the core. Look, let's just be very, clear and frank about this, you know, the people that support Trump are racists or have a high tolerance for racism. It's that basic. And we can't be, you know, worried about their sensibilities and sensitivities because this is the life and death of literally millions, hundreds of millions and billions on this planet. Trump has his finger on nuclear weapons. This is a demented bully, as Bob Avakian has said. And we are facing you know, this incredible situation now where we have to stop this regime from consolidating fascism because of what this is doing right now to the lives of people who are being caged on the border, you know, who are being uh, sterilized against their will in these detention camps in, in Georgia. Um, we're seeing this white supremacist movement that has been given backing at the highest levels by Trump, these armed vigilantes. You know, this is what we're facing. And what's required is a social movement, people in their tens and hundreds of thousands, and then in their millions coming together. This is what we saw and a great lesson uh, of the summer when the protests that were sparked by the police murder of George Floyd, you know, led, you know, to a whole change in conversation and in attitudes. Look, what happened in those weeks and months of protest could not have happened through one-on-one -on -one individual 
conversations to change how people look at themselves and at racism. You know, this was put before people, you know, in a very sharp, in a very, very powerful way by the protests and the uprising. And this is how things change. This is how history is made. This is how society changes. It's through, you know, mass mass social movements. That's the history of this country, whether we're talking about the Black liberation struggle, anti-war movements. And we are now confronting a situation where we have to, in very quick order, you know, develop and advance this struggle to drive this regime from power. So I just wanted to say, this is the kind of discussion that we open up here at Revolution Books. And, you know, it sort of gets back to that point about the individual and the and the, and the social, and where does our power lie? Our power lies in our coming together and acting in unison with all the diversity of perspective and, and, and opinion, but acting you know, in response to the historical challenge that we're facing, which is right now to stop this fascism. In all its dimensions, we can see what it means, you know, whether we're talking about the border, whether we're talking about the further policification of this society, whether we're talking about the very fact that this regime is literally putting more fuel on the fire of global climate change, of global warming. We can go through that. So this is the kind of discussion that we like to open up here at Revolution Books. And uh, I think it's really important, you know, that we're sort of grappling with this, you know, with this issue of the relationship between the individual, because people are individuals. You're very right, Pamela. <laughs> no, to you know that, that that people are individuals, but they are part of larger social groupings, and we interact with people in society. And right now, you know, we are facing this historic challenge, and we have to act, you know, in the millions to respond to it accordingly. But I wanted to hear maybe if um, if Julie and uh, Rossi have more to say about you know the overall situation right now. Um, I would, you know, especially uh, the sharpness of, you know, what's happening, you know, in the um, in the border areas of the of the U.S. and then also, um, you know, more on what's happening in these detention centers. So I'm just wondering if there's more that uh, Julie and uh, and Rossi might want to share, you know, with us. Sure. Sure. I will say that over the past week, our organization, Immigrant Families Together, has been actively involved um, in collecting the stories and information of women in Irwin, the detention center where the whistleblower revealed the allegations against the OBGYN who has conducted hysterectomies without uh, informed consent from women in detention. But I will add that it's not at all limited to Irwin. Um, over the past week, we've spoken to multiple women in other facilities um, throughout the Deep South. These are facilities that are owned by LaSalle Corrections, a for-profit prison corporation. And make no mistake, these are absolutely prisons uh, just by a different name, detention centers, same thing. Um, and it's not just limited either to hysterectomies. Um, we have seen patterns of um, invasive um, procedures, uh, procedures that are un, uh, not likely to have been necessary. For example, we are in contact with um, a lesbian who is actually detained with her partner. And ICE knows that she's detained with her partner because they were um, sanctioned for kissing each other on the cheek while in detention, and one of them went to solitary confinement for that. Um, she has had multiple pregnancy tests during her detention, which has been over a year, and has also had multiple chlamydia and gonorrhea tests. So I think, you know, you either believe in the Immaculate Conception, you think that your guards, your male guards have a problem uh, keeping it in their pants, or you um, have to believe that these are tests that are being done to uh, make money for somebody. So I think what the scope of what you've heard so far in the media is not anything compared to uh, what's actually happening. There is so much more to be uncovered and brought before the public. I will also add that over the past two years, and Rosie um, can speak about this if she'd like to, we've documented the stories of numerous 
women in detention um, who have either been left untreated for conditions um, that needed diagnosis and treatment or um, have had um, surgeries that are believed to have been unnecessary. We know of at least two women who had gallbladders removed, perhaps unnecessarily. Um, and we actually um, lost a, um, a mother for whom we posted bond to cancer of the esophagus. Um, she had all of the symptoms of um, this disease while she was in detention. She presented repeatedly at sick bay and was told just to go back to her cell and drink more water and take ibuprofen. And upon her release, after we posted bond for her, um, we took her to the hospital. A doctor diagnosed her with cancer of the esophagus um, and said in a secret Facebook group for doctors that she believed that ICE had willfully neglected to diagnose and treat this mother who, um, and that if they had done so, that her prognosis would have been better. She passed away last September. Um, so I think the scope of what's happening outside of our site, and of course, as um, Raymond, you point out so importantly, um, you know, this is part of a, an industrial capitalist complex. Um, these detention centers are often in places where there is not much other gainful employment. So these are considered good jobs, right? People are making good salaries. Um, so that sort of encourages them also to com be complicit for long periods of time, um, if not forever. So I think those are just a few of the things that we've observed over the past two, two years um, at Immigrant Families Together. Yeah, I've encountered that a bit too. I've done, uh, I've been, I, sometimes when I'm here, I sit in on the Operation Streamline hearings, pre-COVID times anyway, uh, when, you know, those deport, mass deportation hearings um, and what some of the people, um, the contacts I've met there in the courthouse have told me is that of course the prison contracts there from the government are just massive and bloated. And so that is, it is literally a prison economy down there. Uh, uh, Pamela, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, a question came in. Uh, someone asked if you could share some of the dreams that North African migrants have and what they are seeking. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, actually, most of the people I work with, even though they, they travel through North Africa, they're like, that's their uh, departure point to, into Europe. Most I talk to are coming from West Africa. Uh, you know, the biggest thing for them is, you know, well, actually, if you if any of them were to come on right now and say so themselves, uh, they would just say, I just want to live my life. You know, they just want to live. They want to live in peace. Um, but more tactically, more concretely, obviously, people want work. They're seeking uh, work, education and stability and peace in their life. Um, you know, it really depends on the individual. There are people I've met who want to be doctors. Um, there are people who, you know, do other sorts of like day laboring. Uh, it really depends on the person. Um, I think it also depends on like what they're exposed to in the integration process. For example, if they get placed in a rural um, community in Italy, they're probably not going to have a lot of exposure to what is even available to them. Whereas if somebody leaves and goes to Paris or goes to Belgium, they're going to find out, wow, there's a much wider array of opportunities for me to pursue here. So education becomes maybe a bit more um, pressing for them, stuff like that. Um, so it really, it really depends. Um, and it does depend a lot too on, um, on their circumstances where they land after they're transferred from um, those first reception cities after they're rescued. Uh, someone else asked uh, while you're on the screen here, uh, Pamela, if uh, any of the North African migrants talk about the history of European imperialism or the Europe's domination over their over their you know societies. If they do. They do. I mean, they talk about it in much simpler terms, but they're very aware of who colonized them. You know, I work with a lot of people from Senegal, uh, Gambia. Um, you know, they're you know. Nigeria too, everybody remembers, you know, who colonized them before. So, um, so they're aware, they know, they know where they stand and they're very clear when they come to Europe, how they're discriminated against for the color of their skin. Um, 
yeah, they know. And um, but again, it's it, the part of the issue is is that they haven't got a platform to actually speak and be heard about it. And this is something that we're trying to account for too. Is to the podcast that we have actually called Open Encounters is a good place for that. We're trying to expand more there so they can actually just speak as they want to about those sorts of things. Um, but yes, they, they are aware. They are aware. Uh, Pam Laskin. Yes. Uh, hold on. I just lost my, uh, my image here. Okay. Pam Laskin. Um, could you share with us some of the um, experience you've had in reading you know the readings and of of this this work on you know on the on the Rohingya people and uh, both when you've done readings of this, but also when the book has been read and studied by students. And you know what has been the effect of this book? What kind of questions has it opened up or posed? And you know, well, I think it? it's yeah. very it's a very different experience when. It was published two years ago. I feel in light of a lot of the Black Lives Matter movement and what's going on in our country, the idea of a caste system, the Rohingya Muslims and the caste system being at the bottom of the, um, the system that has excluded them from every right doesn't feel so very different today as I'm reading it, as it did when I read it a few years back, I don't think I was as attuned to how much of a chaos system we have here in America. I just think that my awareness has expanded and I just finished Isabel Wilkerson's cast, the book. And, um, and I really see how the, I mean, it's devastating for the Rohingya Muslims, but guess what? It's, um, we have so many devastations in so many parts of the world. What Pamela is describing, what Julie's describing, what Rosie went through, and right here in America, the way people of color are being treated is abysmal. And what opportunities, what doors are open for them? in our country, in America. You know, when I did the research on the Rohingya Muslims, I understood why they wanted to leave. And now I feel, I mean, they were not fleeing to America, certainly. They were fleeing to Indonesia and they were um, fleeing to Malaysia. But, and there were, um, there weren't great opportunities there. But I thought, let's say, you know, take a big leap fictionally that they were fleeing to America. What opportunities do we have here now? That's how I feel in a really um, big way, unfortunately. I don't know if that answers your question, Ray, but. Sure, no, sure. Um, you know, and I wanna um, commend to everyone's attention that the two books that have been read from tonight, um, Pam, you know, uh, Pam Laskin's book, um, the, the, um, the, the Pam Laskin book and Rosie's book, both of them are available online at revolutionbooksnyc.org. That's to say that you can get Why No Goodbye, which is the book from which Pam Laskin was reading, that book, that young adult novel is available for purchase and for your delectation at revolutionbooksnyc.org. And Rosie's book, The Book of Rosie, A Mother's Separation at the Border is also available at revolutionbooksnyc.org. So I want everyone uh, to get these books and to let other people know that they can get these and other books, you know, books that matter at Revolution Books. So it would be very, very delinquent on my part, derelict on my part, not to let people know that the authors here have these books and that Revolution Books, you know, has these books uh, available. So that's uh, very important for people to know about. 
Uh, there's a question that uh, is being asked of Julie, and that is, uh, let me just pull it up here. Uh, Julie, can you, you can hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Someone is asking, um, have these uh, unnecessary surgical practices, we're talking about the, the mass forced uh, hysterectomies at the uh, detention camp in, in Georgia. The question is, have these uh, surgical practices escalated in the past months or have they been occurring since the inception of the ICE detention camps? So interesting question here. It is an interesting question. And that's certainly one of the questions that the legal team um, that we are providing support to is interested in is really determining the timeline. Um, how far back does this practice date? So as I was alluding to um, earlier, you know, at our organization, uh, we have listened to a number of mothers and women who have come out of detention. Um, and this is certainly uh, medical Abuse and neglect are certainly not issues that are unique to women, although I think there are certain aspects of their experiences that are certainly unique. Um, we believe that this is not a new practice. Um, it's just been allowed to continue with so much impunity that I think the scope of the practice um, has has expanded exponentially. Um, and so, I, you know, I think that there are... Um, so many dynamics influencing the ability for uh, these facilities to continue this kind of behavior. Um, one is the lack of oversight, um, the lack of uh, attention being paid to the relationship between the facilities themselves, the Department of Homeland Security and ICE, um, and private contractors. This is a big, big business. Um, the OBGYN um, who is being accused of these acts at the Irwin facility, he doesn't actually work at the Irwin facility. He's a private OBGYN in the community. Um, but he's someone who has been, uh, who's paid a $500,000 fine for Medicaid and Medicare fraud in the past. He's someone who this week it was revealed is not board certified. And NPR um, in the past year, last summer, actually had a report about the detention facilities in the Deep South and the low bar uh, that's required for medical practitioners to be able to work at these facilities. So I think there are just so many variables that um, collide and collude to make this behavior um, no more normative uh, than you might ever expect. Wow. We've, um, we've had, um, were you going to say something, Pam? Um, no, just, I'm just, yeah. the horror of hearing these details, not that I didn't know it, but to be spelled out as such, Julie, it's just no surprise, but, but so depressing. Yeah, I, I do have to say that what's happening in that detention center, um, you mean, one, it's not, uh, unique and new, um, you know, we've, you know, it is actually the legacy, you know, the current day expression of something that has been part of the history of this country for sterilization of immigrants, minorities, um, you know, there's going back, you know, and Dorothy Roberts, um, great social theorist wrote a book called Killing the Black Body in which she talks about the whole history of the denial of reproductive autonomy to black women, you know, and of course its roots in the enslavement of black women and black people, Africans. And um, this is something, you know, that is, you know, the mass sterilizations that took place in Puerto Rico, um, you know, in the 1950s through the 1970s, um, you know, this has been, you know, practiced by you know, U.S. imperialism, and it's been directed largely at uh, people of color. Uh, there's a book called Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington uh, that gets into that. And I do want to say to the audience that we are planning to do a special program uh, on what's happening in these camps 
or you know, in the detention camp in Georgia with some of the people that are involved in that, the activists and advocacy groups, as well as some of the legal people. So we're hoping to do a full program as part of the 60 defiant days. So um, I think what, what Julie said is, is quite right, that this has escalated under the, the regime, but it hasn't started with this regime and it's getting shielded, these crimes you know, against humanity. And you know this war on women is uh, uh, is uh, you know is 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 being escalated uh, in the ways that people have been talking about. Um, so um, that's uh, that's what I wanted to say about that. And I just wanted in in this you know light, I wanted to say a little more about Revolution Books and our fund drive because you know we're talking about uh, upcoming programs and uh, what we need to be doing at this bookstore and. You know, I do want to say that this is this program tonight is just such a a, 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 a wonderful illustration of why this bookstore really matters, why we need to support this bookstore. You know, to be having this kind of dialogue and this kind of uh, engagement, and all of us, you know, sort of, you know, grappling with one of the biggest questions confronting humanity, which is these mass migrations. Sixty-five million people who are fleeing from, you know, fleeing their homelands for all the reasons that we've gone into. And uh, we are launching or have launched um, this $15,000 fund drive. And we're really calling on people, counting on people, you know, to support Revolution Books and its critical work um, at this time when this Trump-Pence regime must be driven from power. Our fund drive is to raise, our goal is to raise $15,000 $15,000 by October 10th. And this really is a unique resource. You know, it is, uh, as we say, a beacon for a whole new world. And uh, it's a place that uh, values critical thinking and the poetic spirit and the struggle for the truth. And this is a place, as we've seen today, where people bring their insights, bring their experiences, bring their questions. And we, uh, we get into it, we grapple with these things to get you know, deeper understanding, to understand why the world is the way it is and how it can be changed, radically transformed through revolution. And um, you know, the beating heart of this bookstore, as I said earlier, is the new communism that has been uh, developed by Baba Vakian. And uh, Baba Vakian is the architect of a whole new framework for human emancipation and um, this new communism is the method and approach, the scientific method and approach. It's the strategy and the vision, you know, to make a revolution, to put an end to all of these horrors and to go on to build a, a society and world in which human beings can truly flourish. So that's what sort of is the high octane of this bookstore. And it's the interaction between this new communism and all of the experience of humanity and the work and the insights of others that is really sort of what drives this bookstore. And we are about uh, a revolution to create a whole new world. And um, this fund drive is really essential to the well-being of this bookstore. Uh, we want to use these funds to loft and catapult the 60 defiant days into the media and throughout society uh, in a way that can really influence, you know, the thinking of people and, you know, and the capacity and the willingness of people to go into the streets to join with the call from refused fascism to drive this regime from power. And as I said, to raise people's sights to the revolution that humanity needs and the revolution that really is possible. But right now, the most urgent question for all of us is to drive this regime from power. Um, in terms of the upcoming um, 60 Defiant Day programs, I just want everyone to know, mark your calendar, and you'll be hearing a lot more about this on September 30th, uh, in collaboration with the Brooklyn Book Festival, the 60 Defiant Days from Revolution Books is going to be uh, hosting a dialogue between Andy Z, the spokesperson for Revolution Books, and also a co-initiator of Refuse Fascism and uh, its call for people to take to the streets in nonviolent sustained uh, protest to drive this regime from power. He is 
uh, going to be in a dialogue with Jason Stanley, who wrote a book called How Fascism Works, which has become uh, a, 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 a important reference book in these times to understand where this Trump phenomenon came from, what are the analogies and what are the lessons of history. Uh, they are going to be having a dialogue on September 30th at 7 p.m. Uh, the title of it is How Fascism Works and How to Stop It. How Fascism Works and How to Stop It will be a dialogue. And uh, you'll be hearing more about that. We have other programs uh, in the offing. But I'm calling on all of you both to be aware of 60 Defiant Days, uh, get involved with it, and to donate. To donate to the six to the fifteen thousand dollar fund drive, uh, people can donate through uh, going by revol go to revolutionbooksnyc.org. They can also donate through Venmo, and that's at Rev Books NYC. That's for Venmo, Ven Venmo, excuse me, and they can do it through Cash App, and that's the dollar sign Rev Books NYC. Um, your support enables Revolution Books, as I said, to really take this 60 defiant days forward. It also helps us recover from the loss of sales due to the pandemic. I mean, we had to shut down for several months and we're now reopening, uh, but for limited hours. And uh, we, you know, have to recover some of that lost revenue. And we want to restock our shelves with the books that people really need in the books that matter. And all of that is to meet the moment, this moment of great challenges of our time. So um, again, call on people to make a donation and they can also put this on their Instagram. Let people know about Revolution Books and this fun drive. Put it on your Instagram, spread the word, let people know, tell your friends, uh, tell your colleagues, tell the students, tell, the professionals tell the rich people who have good consciences, the wealthy people that revolution books is there. Uh, we want to raise funds from all quarters among all sections of people. And this campaign to raise these funds depends on lots of donors and lots of creative ways in which people are throwing in. So support this precious place um, and be part of this movement to drive the regime from power and the struggle and the great, great enterprise to build a whole new world so that all of what we're talking about will be something that will be viewed in the museums and not something that is the reality, the horrifying reality uh, of our lives in this planet right now. So that's what I wanted to say about the fun drive. And I thought we should take uh, a few more minutes uh, for our speakers to make some closing remarks, uh, some reflections they might have. Um, and uh, let me start with, uh, with Julie and Rosie, if they have some thoughts uh, in closing out the program tonight. Um, yes, thank you. I, I was thinking as you were speaking about just coming back briefly to that uh, the question of why, and I, I just want to emphasize the asylum seeking system in the United States is wholly um, based upon that very question. And so one of the things that we've seen repeatedly with asylum seekers is that when they arrive, at the border, they're asked to tell, well, why are you here? Why did you come? And they'll say, well, I came here. They'll often say, I came for a better life. I came for a better life for my children, which is not, by the way, a valid reason for seeking asylum. And so what will happen is, is that that initial story is taken down. Of course, it's not the complete story, right? Because nobody at the border has earned the trust um, of anyone to have the right to hear that story. And so what happens is eventually in court, that initial story will be represented to the asylum seeker and they will, they will be asked, well, why didn't you say what your real reason is for coming? Um, and why, you know, why didn't you make a complete report? And so um, I just wanted to, to bring that back to the conversation because I do think to continue to grapple with these questions about um, you know, the labor that we expect uh, people of color, whether immigrants or not in this country, to do for us 
um, to justify perpetuating a system that abuses them is a question that I hope that all of us will continue to interrogate. Eh, y Rosy, eh, eh, Raymond, le gustaría saber si tiene algunas palabras para cerrar. Bueno, más que nada quiero agradecer este, la invitación y, bueno, agradecer eh, la participación de todos. Entendí un poco, aunque no todo al 100%, pero este, estoy muy agradecida de que de que puedan compartir con, conmigo y nosotros con ustedes eh, lo que es mm, esta historia en la que estamos atravesando un tiempo muy difícil, pero unidos creo que podemos más. Um, Rosie says she'd like to thank everyone for being here tonight, that even though she didn't understand everything, that she appreciates the opportunity to be able to share a bit of her story with you um, and to be in conversation about these issues. I'll just echo the same thing um, and say, uh, it was a pleasure to be here with all of you um, to get to know your organizations and your work. Um, and big thanks to Revolution Books and to Raymond for, for having me. Um, I will say lastly, um, I think the closing remark I would like to make is just merely for you to go to the website and see the faces of the people who we profile um, and read their story. Um, a lot of those stories to start are the journey stories. So it's a tough read because you hear about the human rights abuses that they faced, uh, the torture that they suffered. But beyond that is a person and they do want to be seen and um, they have trusted me with their stories and given those to me um, as a point to elevate the issue. So please take a look at them. It's migrantsofthemed.com and be really delighted if you um, met some of those people. It's also partially available in Spanish, but um, totally in Italian, and we're growing our um, archive also in German. So that will come later this fall. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pam, Pamela, and um, Raymond, Rosie, Julie. Thank you all for sharing your stories. Raymond, thank you for sharing your vision and your passion for change. And my concluding statement is we are being assaulted on every, every level possible. Um, our human rights, our asylum seekers, uh, women's rights, the rights of prisoners, um, our health care, our climate. We really cannot um, we have to keep, we have to persist with the fight because the fight is huge and it seems to grow bigger every day. And I am encouraging everyone to go out and vote and make your voices heard. And even with that vote, persist in the battle to make the world a better place because we only have each other. And that's, that's that point. vote, I love that. <laughs> We only have each other. We only have each other. All right. Um, I want to thank all the speakers. Um, lest I forget, we didn't get the website from Julie. Julie. Is Julie still with us? I, let's see. Let me. I am. Yeah, the website. ImmigrantFamiliesTogether.com. Okay, good. So, and Pamela, could you write your um, website? I know Immigrant Families Together in the chat. Sure. And it's yeah. MigrantsOfTheMed.com. So okay. put it in the chat. And um, uh, Julie, you'll put it in the chat. And I also want to uh, remind people that um, the two books uh, are available at Revolution Books nyc.org and that's um, Why No Goodbye by Pamela Laskin and um, Rosie's, uh, excuse me, um, uh, Rosie Pablo Cruz, The Book of Rosie, A Mother's Separation at the Border. 
I want to thank, ah, there you are. Thanks for putting it up there. Um, so uh, I want to thank all of the uh, speakers for their presentations, highly stimulating, highly informative. Uh, thought it was a very robust discussion and exchange. I want to thank the audience for their probing questions and comments. And uh, we go forward from here. And September 30th is the dialogue between Andy Z and Jason Stanley, how fascism works and how to stop it. And October 3rd is the next big nodal point for refuse fascism and it's 60 days of protest, you know, going into and through the elections, uh, mass sustained nonviolent protest uh, to create a situation um, where more and more people come into the streets, uh, taking up the cause of driving this regime from power and continuing and stepping up the battles on all these different fronts, uh, especially what we're witnessing today with letting these cops off the hook uh, who killed Brianna Taylor and you know the struggle uh, to end institutional racism and police terror is continuing even as the Trump regime tries to quash it violently. And this is the situation we're confronting and more to be discussed at Revolution Books and as part of 60 Defiant Days, talks, dialogue, performance in the name of humanity, the Trump Pence regime must go now. Thank everyone. And uh, the speakers can stay behind. We'll just have a little five minute uh, private chat. Okay, that's it. Bye-bye to the audience.